And joining us today, we have New York Times bestselling author, Jeff Benedict. He has a new book out called The Dynasty, all about the Patriots run in, of the last 20 years and some of the phenomenal things they've been able to accomplish on the field. Jeff, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, and it's good to be here with you. Awesome. Well, I, you know, I always like to sort of start these off just because of the state of the world here. How are things? Everyone's happy, healthy, safe in your neck of the woods there? Uh, we're doing everything we can to, to be safe. Uh, families taking the COVID precautions quite seriously. And uh, so far, we've managed to avoid it. And uh, yeah, doing yeah. the best we can. Yeah, well, that's just it. Taking things one day at a time there for sure. But uh, I mean, with, with all this extra time there, uh, you know, are, are you sort of taking a little bit of a break from writing or because you've got all, all this downtime and you're sort of cooped up at home, have you thrown yourself into a, a new project right away? Uh, I don't have any downtime, actually, because the uh, I mean, the, the dynasty's only been out for a month and the uh, because the interest in it's been as strong as it has, um, both here in the States and overseas, I've been pretty much going, it's been full time nonstop since the book was released in September. So I haven't, I mean, I, the COVID situation hasn't really, it's changed how we promote books. The whole industry has been affected by that. But in terms of the uh, time commitment, that hasn't really abated at all. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. It's just uh, maybe a, a different means of sort of doing the promotion yeah. tour than, than the traditional. Right. Thing, right. Awesome. So, I, I mean, you, you don't solely focus on sports books here. You, you've got a wide range of, of books that you've released over the years, 16 of them. And everything ranges from, you know, sports to E. coli outbreaks to, you know, forensic scientists and all that. So w when you're, trying to pick a topic for your next book there. What, what's your process mm -hmm. like when you're trying to sort of whittle down what that focus is going to be? Um, I mean, that's, the process has changed over the years. It's <clears throat> when I first started 25 years ago, uh, it, <laughs> it was dramatically different than now because now um, there, I have a lot of good projects that come to me and um, whether it's people uh, organizations, agents, but I have a lot of projects that come through the door, most of which I, I end up turning down, not because they're not good projects and not because they don't uh, merit a book. Um, it's just, I can only do one book at a time. And so I end up actually having to pass on a lot of really good project book ideas. But for the most part in the last, say, eight years or so, my focus has shifted almost exclusively to, uh, you know, big sports topics that lend themselves to biographical treatment. So Steve Young's biography, Tiger Woods' biography, the New England Patriots is a biography about a franchise. And so, um, and that's just been sort of a natural process. I didn't necessarily set out to end up where I am now, but it's, it's a good place to be. And so I anticipate for the next few years to stay in the space I'm in because there's a real interest and in demand in um, serious sports biographies. Uh, and it's a good place to be. I mean, as an author at this point in my career, to be able to do these kinds of books is something I feel really grateful to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of the Patriots there, I mean, it, it, it's no secret that the, they're, they're a very tight to the vest organization. They like to keep things in house, they, you know, it's the Patriot way, yada, yada, yada there. Right. So right. Th that doesn't necessarily lend itself maybe the, the greatest towards writing a story about a franchise like that, because, you know, when you're looking for quotes and sources and all of that it becomes a little bit more challenging. But throughout this book there, you've got so many phenomenal, you know, nuggets and quotes and insights there. W was there anyone who maybe surprised you with how candid they were when you were doing the interview process for this? Um, you know, I, I think when I go into projects like this, I mean, what you, what I hope for is that, that everybody will be candid. Mm -hmm. And that over time, by building relationships with the subjects that you're interviewing, 
that um, you will get to a place in an interview where they will open up and reveal things in a way that are meaningful and intimate. This is a story that um, at the end of the day, it has two qualities. It needs to be epic, big, and it needs to be intimate in scope. And so um, I, I, I try to get everybody that I interview to, um, to go places in, a, in an interview that they maybe haven't gone before. And so what, what's surprising is not necessarily when people go there, but it's, I'm, I'm often surprised at things they say. And so for example, um, I was told by plenty of people that Tom Brady would not be forthcoming. He wouldn't say anything because all you have to do is watch his press conferences. He talks and talks and talks, but doesn't really say anything. And um, when I went into the interviews, I, I didn't focus on that. In other words, I didn't pay attention to what people had said about him and how he would be in the interview. I just prepared my questions for the kind of interview that I hoped we'd have and that I wanted to have. And um, I spent over 20 hours just crafting the questions for my first interview with Tom Brady. And, and then I spent another three hours on the day of the, that first interview. I spent another three hours alone in the, in the room where I'd be doing the interview. And I went over those, those questions that I'd already spent 20 plus hours crafting. I spent another three hours on the day of refining and perfecting those questions, sometimes rearranging the order of a word or a sentence. And when he came in the room, uh, we had what I consider to be a phenomenal interview. And all those things that everyone had said to me about the way he would be in an interview were, were not true. I mean, it just wasn't accurate. That's not the way he was. And it's not the way the interview was. And he said a lot of things, I think, when you talk about some of these intimate nuggets and stories in the dynasty, a lot of them involve him. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the best stories in the book involve Tom Brady and things we've never known or heard about him, despite all that's been written and said about him over the last 20 years. And so I think that's part of the job. And when you, when you take a biographer's approach to a book like this, it's using the same skills and tools that I would use to do a biography on Tiger Woods or Steve Young and apply it to a whole organization. And so even though this isn't Tom Brady's biography or Robert Kraft's biography or even Bill Belichick's biography, the fact is there are three central characters in this epic story about a franchise and each of them has to be approached the same way that I would if I were doing a biography about one of them. Yeah, yeah. No, if that makes sure. sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's hard to fathom now because, you know, any, anyone who's under the age of 30 probably can't even remember a time when the Patriots weren't a competitive franchise. <laughs> but, right. but when Robert Kraft took over, you know, the, the Patriots, are, they were a hot mess of, of an NFL franchise, right? So he inherits Bill Parcells at that time, who is, the, you know, the epitome of sort of an old school coach. And... Robert Kraft sort of comes in as, as that new wave owner with lots of new ideas and how he wants to sort of reshape the franchise and sweeping changes and all of that there. Do you think that that relationship was just sort of doomed from the start and they were never going to coexist? Or did, did you maybe see a path where they could have sort of stretched out that, that existence a little bit longer, but for whatever reason, it just sort of fell by the wayside? Uh, that's a great question. And let me, let me, preface it by saying you're absolutely right about the fact that when Robert Kraft bought the Patriots, they were a disaster, both on the field and off. Yeah. On the field, they were the worst team in the NFL. Uh, off the field, they were in real financial trouble. It's, they were in such bad financial shape that their stadium had gone into bankruptcy and the league was actually loaning them money just so they could pay their players and make payroll each week. That's how bad the Patriots were when Kraft entered the picture. Yeah. As far as the relationship between Parcells and Kraft and whether it was doomed from the start, I would say it probably was just because of the, this is about personality. And so um, Parcells was the most accomplished coach in the NFL at that point in time. 
he's set in his ways. He's not going to change who he is or how he does things. And I think in a, to a certain degree, you shouldn't expect him to. He's, he's won. He's, mm-hmm. he's won consistently. He is who he is. It's sort of like, why should he change? And then in comes an, an owner who realizes that this organization has to change the way it does business because it has failed for 20 years under the old model. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's got real financial burdens to deal with. He's just borrowed $173 million to buy the worst franchise in the NFL. And so he has tr- tremendous pressure on him. So when you think of it that way, this was a collision course from the day it started for these two guys. Um, I think in Kraft's case, although those three years with Parcells were certainly unpleasant for, for Kraft, and they were not enjoyable, they were miserable. I mean, here's a guy who spends 20 years essentially chasing his dream, which was to buy the New England Patriots. He finally gets to the promised land. And then once he's there, he realizes this isn't what I thought I was getting. I mean, this is miserable. And after three years with Parcells, I think he really was looking at it like, I, I just can't believe what I've got now. That's how bad the relationship had become in the environment. And so the switch is made. And I think those three years that they spent together proved to be really important down the road. It's one of those things where when you're going through something that you can't stand because it's so unpleasant, it's miserable, it's not what you wanted. A lot of times you realize later that there were there were a lot of things about that process that paid dividends down the road. If you're the kind of person that wants to learn from those experiences and Robert is that kind of guy. And I think what you saw with his relationship with Belichick and the way things started to go after uh, the year 2000, a lot of that was predicated on what Kraft went through with Parcells and to a lesser extent with Pete Carroll. I mean, his relationship with Carroll was excellent. They didn't have any friction, but obviously the Patriots didn't win with Pete Carroll either. And so it's those two tenures, Parcells for three years and then Carroll for three years, that really positioned Kraft to know exactly what he wanted in a coach and the direction he wanted to take the franchise. And then Belichick is that guy. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, speaking of, Pete Carroll there, you know, it, it's not like it, it was a runaway disaster with him at the no. helm there, that, you know, 562 win percentage and, you know, had a playoff appearance there, but talk about polar opposite in terms of personality types for going from one end of the spectrum to the other between Parcells and Carroll there uh, for, for whatever reason, it ultimately didn't work out there, but you know, you, you look back on it now and all the success Pete Carroll went on to have with, you know, USC, all the success he's had with, with the Seahawks there, you know, is it just a matter of it wasn't the right fit at the right time? Or do you think he's now completely reinvented himself as a coach there? Well, I think it's like everybody else, right? Uh, the, Bill Belichick is now considered the greatest coach in the league and maybe the greatest coach ever. Mm hmm. His first head coaching job in Cleveland is largely looked at as a disaster. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he was fired after four seasons, three of which were losing seasons, and he was essentially run out of town. Um, I think Pete Carroll's first head coaching experience uh, in New England was, you know, each year that the team got worse, their record yeah. declined from year one to year two to year three, and then he got fired. Making it as a head coach in the NFL is extremely challenging and difficult. All you got to do is look around the NFL right now. Look at all the first year head coaches. Look at Matt Patricia up in Detroit. Look what's happening. Look what's happening with the New York Jets. It's hard. And so I think what you see with the great ones is when they get the chance to do a coaching job and then they come back for a second time things are different. The good ones learn from the experience. Pete Carroll definitely did that. I think we would look at Pete today as one of the best, most elite coaches in the ranks of the NFL head coaching class today. I mean, how can you argue with that? I mean, look what he's done in Seattle. And so, and I think, and it's interesting, right? If you look at the Patriots track record with head coaches, since Robert Kraft arrived, they've only had in 25 years, this is a team that's only had three coaches, Bill Parcells, Pete Carroll, and Bill Belichick. 
<laughs> Those are Kraft's three guys yeah. in 25 years. There is no other team you can point to in the history of football that have had three coaches like that in 25 years. I mean, that's three of the best of all time Yeah, that came from the same team. And Robert hired two of them. And so I think, look, I think when he picked Pete Carroll, he picked a great coach. But he was a great coach that maybe you could say needed that experience that he went through in New England. And then by the time he gets to U Seattle, I mean, obviously, there was a big stop in between at USC, as you mentioned. But by the time he gets to Seattle, he's fully ripened and ready to do what he's done and take his team to the Super Bowl a couple, couple of times and knock on the door a couple of more times. Yeah, yeah, no. And, you know, now that we are in sort of the, the, the Belichick era, you know, again, a lot of people don't even remember sort of how Bill ended up in New England there, right? You know, right. It, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> You got to figure today with the blogs and the Twitter sphere and all right. of that going on that if there were to be a trade of a first, a fourth and a seventh for a head coach and a fifth and a seventh, the Internet would explode. Right. Oh, it's great. I mean, to me, this is one of the there's so many great parts in the story of the dynasty. Right. I mean, and the two that involve Parcells and Belichick are fascinating because when you think about it, both of those guys were traded. I mean, when Parcells was in New England, and I love the stories, right, in, in the book where Kraft and Parcells are basically fighting. They're, they're brawling. I mean, by the time you get to the AFC Championship game in 1997, here they are on the eve of the Super Bowl. They're going to go play Green Bay. This should be like the high point of the franchise, and it's not. I mean, it, it is miserable, acrimonious fighting going on in New Orleans. In, in, and then when the game is over and the Packers beat the Patriots, Parcells doesn't get on the plane to fly home with the team. And you have his assistant coach, Bill Belichick, who is on the plane. What is he doing? First of all, he's walking up and down the aisle of the plane and he's kneeling down at the seats of the young defensive players like Teddy Bruschi and Ty Law and Lawyer Malloy and one-on-one -on -one telling them how great of a season they've had. He's trying to buck them up and lift them and compliment them. And you've got these players that are so confused. They're going like, first of all, our head coach isn't on the plane. Here's our defensive coordinator walking around as if he is the head coach. And you got Teddy Bruschi sitting in the back of the plane going, I guess he is going to be the next coach. <laughs> I mean, which is just crazy, right? And then you have this situation where Parcells leaves and quits and he wants to go coach the Jets, but he can't because of his contract in New England. And it, it, it comes to a head where the Patriots basically orchestrate a trade where they allow the Jets to hire him in exchange for draft picks. It was it, unprecedented at the time. But three years later, the shoe is on the other foot. The Jets are trying to, Parcells is trying to basically shoehorn Belichick into the head coaching job in New York. He wants to go to New England. Parcells doesn't want to let him go to New England. And they now they have to do an even bigger trade to get Belichick out of New York and back to Foxborough. And those stories to me are great, like behind the scenes, part the curtain, go in the rooms where these really heated arguments and conversations, and then ultimately negotiations and deals took place, some of which were done over the phone. But I love the phone call, for example, where, Be where Parcells calls Kraft, who he hasn't spoken to in over three years because there's so much acrimony between them, and says it's Darth Vader. You know, <laughs> calling to see how badly you want this guy, Bill Belichick, yeah. and they work out a deal on the phone. I mean, that's a great moment to, to sort of listen in on that phone call and go, wow. So that's how that happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, looking back on it, and you can even go across multiple sports here. Is there a trade that sticks out to you that worked out better for a franchise right. Than the Bill Belichick coming over from the, the Jets deal. Can you think of anything that that's more benefited a franchise long term? I would compare that trade that Robert Kraft did with Bill Parcells. So this was the Kraft Parcells negotiation, which orchestrated the trade sending Belichick from New York to New England which people thought at the time that Parcells had taken Kraft to the woodshed because he got a first round draft choice for Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. And every pundit 
that you can imagine in the NFL said, that is a really lopsided trade, meaning lopsided in the favor of the Jets because they got a first round pick for a, an unproven coach. Mm -hmm. But now, if you look back at nine Super Bowl appearances and six Super Bowl championships that Belichick has brought to New England, this looks more lopsided than when the Yankees got Babe Ruth from the Red Sox. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it looks worse than that. I mean, I do believe that this is the most lopsided trade in the history of professional sports. I mean, I, I think it is. I mean, think about it. If the Jets had Belichick for the last 20 years, how yeah. different would the futures of those two franchises been? I mean... You'd probably have a lot less and fewer depressed Jets fans in your life. That, that'd be for sure. <laughs> no question. No question. So, I, I mean, we, we find ourselves sort of in, in almost the polar opposite era uh, of, you know, 20, 30 years ago, where it used to be head coach, front office driven. We're now in sort of that player empowerment era where, you know, you, you, you look at LeBron James. If, if, if he doesn't like Frank Vogel, the Lakers are firing him tomorrow, right? Yeah. But, but here you have you know, superstar Tom Brady and Belichick openly butting heads for quite a few years now, you know, how much of them being able to continue to go out there and have the success that they had is, you know, predicated on them being able to sort of come together and work out their differences versus, you know, maybe Robert Kraft playing peacemaker. Do you see them all playing their own role or, you know, is one sort of relationship more important than the other for that final product? I think that the, you know, there's been an ongoing debate for the last 10 years or so throughout the NFL about who's more responsible for the dynasty. Is it Tom Brady or is it Bill Belichick? And from my perspective, like that's an incomplete question mm -hmm. because the owner has to be included in that debate. And I would argue, I think there's a strong case to be made that his role might actually be even more important in the big scheme of things than either Brady or Belichick. And, and let me say what, explain what I mean by that. Obviously, Brady is the one with a ball in his hand all the time. And if he's not at the controls, they don't beat Seattle in the Super Bowl. They, don't, they certainly don't beat Atlanta in the Super Bowl. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't happen if Tom Brady's not the quarterback. Similarly, you can argue strongly that if Bill Belichick's not on the sideline with the headset, there's so many things that probably don't turn out well for the Patriots where, in other words, where Brady might not even have the opportunity to win the Super Bowl against Atlanta or Seattle, because coaching has a lot to do with getting the players in a position to do things like that. But here's the thing. If it wasn't for Robert Kraft, Belichick and Brady wouldn't have been together for the last 10 years anyways. Those Super Bowls against Seattle, Atlanta, and the Rams, the three they won, and then the Super Bowls they lost against the Giants the second time and the Eagles in 2018, I think there's a case to be made that the team might not have even made it to any of those five Super Bowls had it not been for the fact that Kraft found a way to, kept, to keep Brady and Belichick married for twice as long as Chuck Knoll and Terry Bradshaw, for mm -hmm. twice as long as Joe Montana and Bill Walsh for twice as long as Bart Starr uh, and, and Vince Lombardi. And so it's just, this is a fact. And the way he did it was by building two very different personal relationships with his coach and his quarterback. His relationship with Brady is more like a father son. It's what kept Brady in New England for 20 years instead of 10. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. I mean, if you just think about that by itself, think about Brady leaving in 2010 or 2011 and going somewhere else and spending the last 10 years in another uniform, the New York Giants, the Rams, the Bears, pick a team. It doesn't matter. If he's not in New England, you have to really ask yourself, would the Patriots have really been to five more Super Bowls? I don't think so. Yeah. And, and at the same time, it's extraordinary that Bill Belichick has stayed in the same job with the same team in the same city for 20 years. And you have to ask this question, what other owner, is there another owner out there 
They could have gotten along with Bill Belichick for 20 years. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but he get, but it works with Kraft. This to me is his, his talent is diplomacy and management. He, that's what he's done in, in New England. Owners are, it's interesting. Owners can really screw up a team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of owners do that. Look around the league. Look at the Redskins or the Washington football team now. Look at the Dallas Cowboys. Look how long it's been since the Cowboys have even sniffed around the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And then look at their owners and look at behavior. And so in New England, what you see is the opposite of all that. What you see up there is a model of restraint and diplomacy. And it has kept... I compare Belichick and Brady to John Lennon and Paul McCartney. They're the Beatles of the NFL. And Kraft's genius was seeing early on what he had on his payroll and realizing that the most important thing he was going to do as an owner was constantly figure out how to keep them together for as long as possible, to extend the runway. Mm -hmm. And he extended it far beyond what anyone has ever done before in the history of this league. In the hundred year history of the NFL, you've never seen a quarterback and a coach stay married for 20 years and perform at the level that Brady and Belichick have done. The secret behind that is craft. Yeah. And we might not ever see another run like this again. It's, it's I don't think so. That rare, right? Yeah. I, I mean, obviously Brady, Belichick, Craft, they get the bulk of sort of the limelight as far as the Patriots dynasty, and rightly so, right? Mm -hmm. But if you had to maybe pick someone who doesn't jump to the front of your mind, who, who did play a huge role in that dynasty there, who's maybe a player or two that people don't necessarily think of, but was absolutely instrumental to their success? You know, um, there's a lot of players that I could reference, but, um, you know, as someone who just spent two years around this organization, the name I would mention is actually not a player. Mm -hmm. um, the name I'd mention is Jonathan Kraft. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I make the compare, he's the team president, but I make the comparison early in the book uh, by saying that he is to his father um, what Bobby Kennedy was to JFK. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, a, it's an appropriate comparison. You, you cannot overestimate the importance of having someone at your side who has that kind of, that, that you can trust their judgment, their counsel, their advice um, 100% all the time. And I think that that's the role that Jonathan's played with Robert. It's an incredible father-son team that's run this organization. Uh, Jonathan's been with his dad from the moment he bought the team. He's been there through every hardship, through every lost through every victory, through every championship, through every setback, he's been there. And I think that kind of, this is a family run business. It, it's like a mom and pop grocery store, but you know, a million times bigger in terms of scope and what they do. But it is at the end of the day, a family business. And when you look around the NFL, you're hard pressed to find situations where truly the family runs uh, the, the team the way this, the Kraft family does. And so I think that consistency and reliability of Jonathan is like an added secret weapon that Robert has. I mean, Robert's a genius on his own, in his own right, you know, in terms of how he, he is as a businessman and how he operates. But one of the best things he does is, you know, he is tremendous at selecting and finding talent, whether it's, finding Belichick to be the coach that no one else wanted. Uh, but you look around him, the orbit of people he surrounded him with, they're all really, really competent, smart people. And no one's probably more competent and smart than Jonathan. And he's had him there the whole time. And I think that consistency at the top of the organizational chart has been invaluable to the, to the on the field product of the Patriots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, obviously you fast forward to today and, you know, finally th there was sort of the parting of ways as far as Brady and Belichick and obviously Tom down in Tampa and uh, Bill is still up in New England there, but having gotten to know them and their personalities, you know, both of them probably have a little bit of them that is 
trying to sort of prove that they didn't need the other to that their success wasn't you know ultimately linked to, to one another and that they can be successful on their own do, do you think maybe one of them is more driven than the other this season to sort of show what they can do now that they are out on their own you know i look i understand the uh i do i understand the temptation right this this kind of uh idea has been pervasive throughout all the talk in the off season from the minute Tom left and through the first four games of the, of the NFL season. But the reality is one of them is on the field with a ball in his hand and the other one isn't. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like they're both players. It, it's, it's different. And they're in very different situations. I think it, it is definitely true that both of them are hyper competitive. I mean, that is part of the reason that they have been so consistent in winning and dominating the rest of the league is because I can't think of a coach who's more driven to beat people than Bill, than Bill Belichick. And I, there is no other player who's more determined to win year in and year out than Tom Brady. And now that they're not on the same team, do they both want to win? Of course. Uh, you know, and they know what the talk is in the league and, and all that, but the fact of the matter is I think once the season starts, I mean, the jobs that each of them have to do are, are very different. And if they were thinking about what we're talking about, they would not be effective. Like, I don't think when Tom Brady goes to work every day in Tampa Bay, he's thinking about besting Bill Belichick up in New England. I think what he's thinking about is how do I get in sync with this, with this new uh, crop of receivers and running backs and the linemen that I got to work with. There's so much for him to do there that, it would be a huge distraction for him to be focused on Bill and what the Patriots are doing up in Foxborough and vice versa. I mean, Belichick's got a team that's got a, the hardest position to replace on any football team is the quarterback because he is the field general. And you've had the same field general for 20 years in New England and all of a sudden he's gone. And, you know, bringing in Cam Newton was a, was a bold stroke of genius. Um, and I think, but I think it's safe to say I don't think Belichick thinks a lot about, frankly, what's going on with Tom Brady right now. He has way too much to worry about, about what's going on in Gillette Stadium with his own team. And uh, look, when you get to the end of the season, if one of these teams is actually in the Super Bowl, you know, maybe there's a moment where you can step back from it a little bit and say, you know, this is pretty sweet. And uh, I'm sure all the discussion will be about the fact that if one of them got there, they got there without the other one. Um, but look, we know football is a, unlike basketball or even baseball, you got 22 men on the field at a time. It's, it's not one guy. And I, and I think Belichick and Brady would both say that, you know, it's personnel around you. It's all the other things, but, uh, look, it's, it is interesting to watch them both despite the fact that they're not together anymore, as I've watched them through the first month of the. 2020 season I don't really see any drop off mm -hmm. in terms of how badly both of them want to get back to the championship I mean that's the thing that's so fascinating is that there hasn't been any diminishment or tailing off and I mean one guy's 43 years old you know and the other guy is ironically the only only uh coach who's older than Bill Belichick is Pete Carroll Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, um, and, but by a sliver. Yeah. And so, you know, look, it, it just proves the point that what the Patriots had for the last 20 years is so unique. And, and I think it's something we'll, we'll probably never see again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, looking back on all the great dynasties across all the sports, whether it's, you know, Yankees or Lakers or Celtics or the, the Patriots here, where, where do you think this Patriots dynasty sort of ranks all time amongst the greats? Well, I think if you if you focus that conversation around the 100 year history of the National Football League, it's the best. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think there's any debate about that. The Patriots dynasty clearly overshadows the Packers of the 60s, the Steelers of the 70s, the 49ers of the 80s. And it, it blows away the Cowboys of the early 90s. I mean, mm -hmm. so the Patriots in the NFL, it's the best. If you expand that to look at all of sports, all of team sports, then I think it's in the conversation with the Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle Yankees. And I think it's in the conversation with the Bill Russell era Celtics. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think there's another dynasty that belongs in that conversation because obviously, look, the Los Angeles Lakers have had more than one dynasty era. They had the Magic Johnson era where they, they really, in the 80s, they were a dominant dynasty. And then they had the Kobe Shaq dynasty, which produced three championships in three years. That, that was a dynasty, but it was a short-lived dynasty. Mm -hmm. And it never came close to realizing its, expect its potential. If you could have kept those two together, again, this goes to management and everything else. But if someone had found a way to keep Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant together for 15 years, who knows how many championships could have come to Los Angeles? And maybe they would be in this conversation, but they're not. And so the only other team I can think of that really is in the conversation with the Mantle DiMaggio Yankees, the Bill Russell Celtics, and the New England Patriots of the Belichick Kraft Brady era might be, and this is a might, might be the Chicago Bulls of the, of the Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen years, because they did win. Let's face it. They won six titles in one decade. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really what the Patriots have done. But the Patriots have done so much more than that. I mean, the fact that they've been to, you know, it's, it's the nine Super Bowls. It's all the AFC championship games. It's the perfect season. And it's been the sustained excellence over 20 years. That, to me, is what separates them from everyone else. It's the fact that they had the same personnel together for 20 years without one year I mean, they have not had a losing season in that entire run. And that to me is the part that I just, I don't see anybody being able to replicate that. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, amazing. Uh, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and uh, discuss what is an absolutely amazing read cover to cover here. Uh, for those that are listening that, that want to learn more about either yourself or any of the projects you have coming up, where can they find more information about you or some stuff that you've got in the works? Uh, I have, my website is just my name. It's jeffbenedict.com. Uh, there's a lot of information on the site, certainly about the dynasty and Tiger Woods projects, about film projects, um, and a lot of social media contact information there. In terms of the book itself, the dynasty is available everywhere, whether it's whether you're an Amazon shopper or a Barnes and Noble shopper or a local bookstore, which I'm a huge advocate of. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's sold everywhere where books are sold. Amazing. The book is The Dynasty by Jeff Benedict. Go out and get your copy today. Thanks so much for joining us, Jeff. Make sure you stay safe and healthy and best of luck in the future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.